So, Prusha made a Core XY. The first one, right? Actually, no. I think with a couple of exceptions, the first announced commercial Core XY that wasn't obscure, and those qualifiers are important because there have been other Core XYs, but the first commercial announced Core XY was actually a Prusha. This one. So it has been a while since that came out, but here, finally, is the Prusha Core 1. Let's go. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. If we want to highlight what's new on the Core 1, especially compared to a Mark IV, then I think the obvious two things are the enclosure and the Core XY kinematics, and everything else kind of branches off from there. The Core 1 will be essentially familiar out of the box to anyone who's got a Mark IV or an S, as the user experience is near identical in all ways other than that, and you're left largely unaware of the technical aspects to the Core 1. Indeed, they've made sure that this printer doesn't need any extra knowledge or experience to use, including small details like not leaving the door open uh, when printing PLA, and even down to things like loading and unloading filaments are entirely unchanged from previous models. If you're upgrading from a Mark IV or S, then you'll be using the same size beds, the same nozzle, roughly the same extruder, and the same screen and operating system, although notably this time around there's touchscreen support right from the start, if you use that. The Core 1 is £874 for a kit, or £1138 for a built one, convert to your own currency as necessary, and also available as an upgrade soon for an as yet unannounced price, I think. And before you jump into the comments to do the whole Prusas are expensive, as I keep saying, it's kind of a matter of perspective. If you compare it to printers that it isn't, like the Ender 3KE or a Bamboo Lab A1 Mini, then yeah, sure, it looks expensive, but all I can say is good luck printing ABS on, on those as they come out of the box without any modifications. The correct printers to compare this to currently don't exactly exist. The closest match to this printer is probably the Creality K2, but only the Plus has been released so far. And the Bamboo X1 is kinda old now, and who knows what they're going to replace that with. There's an Elegu Centauri thing, I'm not yet convinced as to what that even is. Ironically, the closest thing to the Core 1 at the moment that you can buy is probably the Creality K1C, but it's not really that close in reliability or usability at all. However, if your budget isn't Core 1 money, which for a lot of people it isn't, then the Creality K1C is actually a fairly okay alternative. When you also add to the equation that an assembled Mark IV S is currently £910, which is really actually very close to the Core One's price anyway, I suppose you can assert two things are true. Firstly, the Core One has had that price set as a hard limit, which I think is a good move when you consider the market these days. They could have set it to be like $1,500. They could have probably built it more expensively, maybe $2,000. They clearly chose not to. But also, secondly, you could assert that not all of the product that your money is buying is actually physically present with you in the room. Ultimately, I think it's fair to say that in the last decade, Prusa, along with Ultimaker, and the community, of course, they've been the ones to foot much of the bill for a lot of what we take for granted at this time. That's right, Bamboo users, Creality users, and everyone else, Prusa and somewhat Ultimaker major slicer. Moving on, the frame of the Core 1 is actually pretty solid. It's made out of steel, so it's magnetic, which is really handy for me to attach lights to when filming, but also it's really handy for any kind of modification because you can use magnets. I don't know if there's an official way to get these plastic rivets out that hold the acrylic panels on the printer, but I found that using clippers very gently is the most effective method at least for me. The removal of the lid requires the removal of these 
rivets, but it's slightly more annoying than a glass lidded printer, I guess, but that's presumably one of the things they've done to keep the costs down. Plus, apparently this is the same stuff as the Prusa enclosures are made of for, say, the Mark IV, uh, so it's probably less likely to break. I think um, those are considered quite robust. Prusa have sent me some sample prints, which is cool. I've been busy doing my own prints on the machine, mostly prawns, admittedly, but there's some other stuff in the samples that are made out of filament that I don't even own. I don't know if these were actually printed on this exact printer, I suspect they were, but I don't suppose it matters. I might even consider some wood filament with how this looks. I wonder if it smells as bad as when I tried it once. It, it took a week to get the smell of burned wood out of the room, but at least on the core one they've thought about this and they've actually added some possibility of putting a proper vent in the back. And since I have this exact kind of extraction, if you watched my pollution video, you, you will know that. That's really useful for me, because it means I could just hook this thing straight up to a, the air pump that goes out of the out of the vent in the side of the house. This lighthouse, I think, is to illustrate how tall the build volume is on the printer. It's more than the Mark IV and the Mark IV S, and how the quality doesn't really degrade as you get higher up because of the rigidity of the printer. This doesn't surprise me at all after the last video I made. If you haven't watched it, you need to watch it because it's really cool. I didn't get any vibrations on the core one at all, really, in spite of finding that I was able to get them on other printers. This was uh, high speed filming. There's a space on the lighthouse that looks suspiciously benchy shaped. So I guess we're supposed to print a benchy and put it there. I did promise to show you the inside of the Nextruder on the Core 1. As you can see, it's got holes in it. This is again something we discussed last video. I don't know if this is just a board designer or whether or not this actually sheds a meaningful amount of weight. It, it looks cooler. It would be a really cool thing to be able to see with a transparent cover for sure. Maybe I'll get around to doing that. The board on the printer appears to be the same as the Mark IV S with the same NFC module that the Mark IV S added. Probably. But this extra board up top is new. I think it controls the LEDs among other things. I don't know where I read that. So let's talk about one of the biggest advantages to buying Prusa over many other manufacturers. I won't say all because it does vary. And that's the openness of the system, which might be a sore point for bamboo owners right now. You might want to leave the room for a minute. I don't want to upset you unnecessarily. This is what I want to show you. This is the GPIO board that was released with the Mark IV S. And I ordered it straight away at the time when it came out, because this kind of thing is exactly my kind of thing. The board is about £13, which is kind of Raspberry Pi Zero money. Um, doesn't actually have a CPU on it. We'll, we'll get to that. There's not an actual way to route it out of the case yet, so I guess we're waiting for someone to design a cover, um, or maybe it can come out through the where the NFC is. We'll have to see about that. You could always drill a small hole, but... I've just poked it out the corner and not put the screw there to, to stop it from crushing the wire. The GPIO board is not actually all that scary if you're an Arduino proficient maker. It runs on an I2C port back to the main board and the GPIOs are all either nominal 3 volts with virtually no current or they can handle up to 20 volts I think. It might be a bit confusing with the current documentation. I'm I found that quite hard to digest personally, but as I understand it, this is how you wire it. An input would be done like this if you want to use switches, just passive switches without any kind of microcontroller. And if you want to wire up a microcontroller, you would kind of do it like this. All we have to do to control this thing is either send G-code commands that are specifically made to be routed to the board's ports, and those are documented perfectly well, or if you want it to work like an interrupt, you can create files that match the specified names that run essentially as macros. These have G-code commands inside them, and these will run anytime, including while printing. And it's worth pointing out that the guardrails are definitely off when using this um, this board because it doesn't seem like there's much filtering on commands or, or other ways of stopping you from damaging your own printer. I don't think that's a bad thing, but it's definitely something that you need to know if you're using this thing. 
and I used my previously made ESP32 project board to read pulses from the GPIO board's pin 6 into the ESP32 on pin 27. You could use this signal to fire anything you want, I'm using it to count layers. A lot of the potential uses would revolve around automation, so this makes things like maybe trying to push a part off the bed after cooling down, so you could add a delay, things like that. Um, possibly, among other things. You could also have a macro to get the printer to push in heat inserts. That would be a pretty funny use for this. A lot of options there if you can think of them. It's largely just down to how, how good your imagination is. But of course you want to know about my ESP32 board, right? Which is for once an actually good segue to the sponsor, PCBWay. I made this thing a while ago initially for the conductive TPU project that I did, where it came in really useful. The basic premise, I suppose, was that I was fed up of a couple of stupid things that ESP32 boards especially, but also Arduino boards, generally suffer from. First of all, an ESP32 board doesn't fit well on breadboard, anyone who's used one will know this, and it leaves you almost no room for actually putting any wires in. Not to mention the pins on these things are, they're actually technically too big for breadboard, you're not supposed to use fat pins like this on breadboard, and this is probably why your breadboard stop gripping normal wires after a while. But also, secondly, almost all the prototyping I do, maybe you're the same as me, it involves the same few components over and over again, or at least during the testing phase, it involves the same components over and over again. And I just want to have them there on the board. LEDs, buzzers, push buttons, OLED screen, some way to grip the wires, screw terminals, basically, and also the holes for normal jumper wires to go into. It sounds too obvious really, doesn't it? But I couldn't find one, so I just made myself one with PCBWay, and it works, it works fine. I think if I was making it again, and I, I might do it at some point, I would use their assembly service and get an SMD version made that's smaller but has all the same stuff on it. But this one itself has been really helpful to me and I've used it several times now, even just while making videos. So if you have similar needs or are inspired by my obvious solution to an obvious problem and want to do it yourself, then go and check out PCBWay in the links below where you'll find a coupon for new users. Thank you PCBWay for sponsoring this video and also for saving me from having to suffer breadboard. Now back to it. I'm curious about one thing on this printer more than anything else, and that's miniatures. And the plot thickens, maybe. This is as good quality, I think, as the Mark IV was. If you're interested in miniatures and why this is such an interesting question, then I'll link that video again. The TLDR appears to be that pushers are among the best, or perhaps even the best, at printing miniatures, and we don't know why, and that appears to still be the case. Okay, so I am actually curious about two more things, ABS and TPU. The core one apparently implemented compensation for materials in the Z offset after probing the bed. This is something that we saw as a problem in the K2+, Plus, which they are fixing. But with ABS, if you probe the bed at one temperature, like 150 degrees C, but then you print with a heated chamber at 230 C upwards, everything has expanded. Your Z offset isn't the same as when you probed. And so apparently in the core one, uh, they have added the possibility in the firmware to compensate for that. This is very new, so I don't exactly know the details on whether it's some parameter that we have to use or whether it's all automatic. I haven't had any problem by default on ABS. We'll just have to see how that pans out, but it's just interesting to know that that's a thing. And also, I was told that it is going to get rolled back to the Mark IV and Excel, so that's really cool as well. I also asked you all if you had any questions as usual, which is a thing I generally do now if I'm going to review a machine. The vast majority of you actually just answered with whatever you felt like saying that weren't questions, so um, thanks. Chamber temperature was one of them, and the time that it takes for the chamber to heat up. Yeah, the core one does not heat the chamber particularly quickly, nor does it necessarily attain the target it's heading for. This is entirely expected with this kind of setup with the acrylic doors. If you're super into the idea of a constant chamber temperature, then I guess maybe you can mod the printer, but I don't think it's necessary for most cases. I printed this ABS thing that's coming out in a future video while intentionally pointing aircon at the printer. The chamber couldn't stay above 35 degrees C because I was blasting it with cold air from the outside. The print still came out fine. It didn't warp and I didn't even use any glue on the bed. So. This is kind of consistent with things I've said in the past about ABS and being told I'm wrong, but 
we'll not go into that. The bottom line is that for the vast majority of consumer use cases, this is enough. And that's why the vast majority of printers don't come with heated chambers with active heating. Someone asked about Max Flow, which is a very good question. It's the same extruder as the Mark IV S, and it comes with the same HF 0.4 millimeter nozzle, which is the CHT one. In theory, that ought to be able to translate to about 35 millimeters cubed per second on PLA, but in reality, about 25 would be the top end of how far you want to push it, especially for long runs without retraction. The defaults seem to be about that, 23, I think, off the top of my head. When I've pushed it higher, it has failed prints, so that seems to be about where we're at. It is very well tuned in the profiles, as far as I can tell. In terms of whether it's faster than the Mark IV, even though it's got the same flow rate, Put it this way, if you're doing 0.45 line width and 0.2 line height, then to hit the flow rate limit, you're going to be going pretty fast. So yeah, in the real world, you are unlikely to hit the flow rate limit on, on most prints on a 0.4 nozzle. If you go up to a 0.8 nozzle or wider lines or other materials like TPU or very strange kinds of printing, then it does change the calculus significantly. But yeah, in the vast majority of cases, the bottleneck is still the kinematics and not the flow rate. And to back that up, I've got some print speed comparisons. These are out of the slicer, not real world times. You'll see that the core one is currently leading by what could only be described as a non-trivial margin. Also in the questions, MMU integration came up. I've repeatedly asked Prusa to the point of probably nagging that I want to be kept up to date on the situation with the MMU. It's not ready yet. I hope to be able to show you the MMU as soon as it's out. I don't have a date for that, and I'm not sure if they plan to release support as is or try to hold it back while they make something more self-contained. I've seen some prototypes, very early prototypes of things that go on top of the printer that look a bit like an AMS. We'll see. I do want to show you this though. This is Voxel 3D, who's made a third-party enclosure for the XL previously. And this is fascinating because I couldn't design this with the core one but he's managed to design this without actually having a core one. I think I'll probably try and find time to make this, but let me know in the comments if you're interested. That's probably a rhetorical question because of course we're interested. If this works well, it's literally the thing that turns the core one into the actual printer everyone really wants right now. And then it will tick all the boxes, not just most of the boxes. So yeah, that's interesting. The camera was asked about. I think this is just a buddy camera in a new case. It's independent of the machine to the point where you can power it by USB in a different um, in a different place to the printer. It doesn't need the printer to function. I don't know if more functionality will be unlocked later. I would like to see a faster frame rate and maybe time lapse and control over whether it's got infrared on or not, which at the moment is just controlled by how bright the chamber is. Lastly, someone called Steve asked where the googly eyes go. That is a good question, Steve. Very good question. So this brings us to some kind of conclusion. Prusa machines are always really hard to review in a conventional sense because what are you doing? You're just kind of poking at something that's obviously going to work as per the marketing. Generally, you don't get much drama or surprises. So I kind of just didn't review it in a conventional sense. And I hope that I have nonetheless brought you something that you didn't see in other people's content, which is a bit more around the other features the printer has. If you like this and I've done my job right, then there's a link to another video that you can watch. It's the one about the miniatures that I told you about before. And I'll also put a link to how the MMU-3 works, which is really detailed. So if you're thinking about the MMU-3, then also watch that. Links to the Prusa Core 1 are in the description and those are affiliate links. So if you're thinking of buying it, then I would appreciate if you would click those. I will see you next time. Thank you for watching.